Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this sermon video. First, I want to say, if you haven't already done so, you might want to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that the next time we put out a sermon video, you'll be notified about that. But I also want to invite you, if you're ever in the Dallas or the Plano area, we would love for you to come and be our guest here at the Church of Christ on McDermott Road. The sermon that you're about to watch is the first in our new series, Flawed, but faithful, where we're looking at the book of 2 Samuel and specifically the life of David. David was a deeply flawed individual, but in spite of his flaws, he was faithful to God. And you and I can be faithful to God in spite of our flaws. I hope that this is an encouragement to you. Good morning, church. I love you and appreciate you, and I'm excited to start a new series with you. This month, we're talking about uh, 2 Samuel. It's going to be where all of our texts come this month, come from this month, uh, and we're doing that particularly because next month is Texas Bible Bowl and LTC, and they're studying uh, 2 Samuel. In fact, if you're one of the young people that's in Bible Bowl or LTC, raise your hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. And see, and it sounded like a good idea to do a series on 2 Samuel until I realized that all of them know far more about 2 Samuel than I do. <laughs> but uh, I'm excited because this, this is a book, in fact, 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings are a series of stories, a series of books that really tell the story of Israel's fall and why, why Israel fell why God's people eventually end up in captivity in Babylon. And so this story not only chronicles some successes and things that they did well, but really chronicles their sin and the things that they did poorly and highlights some of the, the good kings that they had, but especially the, the kings that did things that were wrong, including, including the best of those maybe, the, the man after God's own heart, David, and, and, and chronicles who he was and the good things that he did, but also, again, his sin and how David was a, a deeply flawed individual like all people are. And, and, and really, this story teaches us that David was, in spite of his flaws, was still faithful to God and that Israel, in spite of their flaws, could be faithful to God. And it reminds us that in spite of our flaws, we can be faithful to God, that God chose, and here's the amazing thing about all of this, that God chooses to make a covenant with and to partner with a person like David and say, I'm going to choose you to work with you, to be like a father to you, and you're going to be like a son to me, and really he does the same thing with all of Israel. And that's, that's an amazing thing, isn't it? That a flawless God would choose a flawed people and say, I'm going to partner with you. And what I want from you isn't necessarily perfection, but faith, faithfulness. And, and here's the thing, that we can be faithful in spite of our flaws. Sometimes I'm afraid that we think that faithfulness is perfection. That faithfulness is flawlessness. And, and if we think that faithfulness is flawlessness, that in order to be faithful to God, in order to partner with God, in order for God to love us and work with us and be in covenant with us, that we have to be perfect, I'm afraid what ends up happening is if we feel like failures. Have you ever, ever felt like that? Discouraged because you think, I've, I've blown it. You maybe look at other people and you say, yeah, I guess they, they seem to have it all figured out and they seem to do everything right and they don't seem to make the mistakes that I make, but I've messed up too bad and I'm too flawed and I've made too many mistakes and there's no way that God can use me. Well, if this story of First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings teaches us anything is that it teaches us that God can use flawed people. In fact, that's the only kind of people that God can use because that's the only kind of people that exist are flawed people. David, a man after God's own heart, a man that God loved and made covenant with and said, I'm going to partner together with you and with your offspring. He was a flawed individual and all of the tribes of Israel were flawed people. 
And yet, in spite of their flaws, God said, I want to make a covenant with you. And if they were faithful, then he could work together with them. Not if they were flawless or perfect, because they never were. But at times, they were faithful. And you and I were never going to be perfect, at least not in this age, right? We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be flawless. We are going to have flaws. But we can, we can be in this age. Right now, we can be faithful. And I don't want any of us to be so discouraged by the flaws that we have, by the mistakes that we've made, by the sins that we've committed, that we think we can't be faithful to God because you can be faithful to God in spite of the flaws that you have. And I think that this story teaches us and helps us to understand that. See, Israel, when we think about Israel, we tend to think about Israel as a group of people. But in reality, not only were they individuals, but they were a tribal people, right? They were made up of 12 different tribes. Sometimes, sometimes during their history, they worked together, and certainly they had a shared history, and they'd been through a lot together, but they were 12 very distinct Tribes And a lot of times they warred with each other. There was tension and there was war amongst the tribes of Israel. Now, Saul had ruled over all 12 of the tribes. You remember Saul was the first king of Israel and he ruled over all of the tribes. But then when Saul died, when Saul was killed in battle, then there were two kings. And the tribe of Judah anointed David to be their king, right? Because that was their, their guy. J- David was a part of the tribe of Judah. And then Saul's son, Ishbosheth. See, I wish I'd named one of my boys Ishbosheth. That's just fun to say. Isn't it? <laughs> Ishbosheth was Saul's son and, and his tribe, Benjamin, and the other 10 tribes of Israel anointed him to be king of those tribes. So the tribes had different kings. Judah had David as their king, and the other tribes, including Benjamin, had Ishbosheth as their king. And for seven and a half years, they fought with each other. For seven and a half years, they fought with each other, and they killed each other, and they were incredibly brutal with each other. And I just can't help but think, as I, as I read through this and thought about that this week, I thought, I can't imagine how God felt during that time. Can you imagine? Here was the group of people that God brought out of Egypt and brought into the promised land. The people that, remember the the period of the judges and that was a horrible time and there was all sort of tension and fighting and war then. And then finally they were sort of united under Saul but there were a lot of problems that went along with that. And now now again there's two different kings and and the tribes are at, at war with each other hating each other and killing each other. And every time, every time that blood is shed, every time that somebody else is killed, every time that somebody does something to reignite the tensions, can't you imagine not only how those tensions would grow and the bitterness would grow, the resentment would grow, and do you know what your tribe did to my tribe? And don't you know what your people have done to my people? And don't you know that you're not part of us? And don't you know that you guys have done all of these bad things? But can't you imagine how God feels during this time about all of that tension and all of that war? But then, then the commander of Ishbosheth's army, so the 10 tribes that have Ishbosheth as, or the 11 tribes that have Ishbosheth as their king, their commander, Ishbosheth's commander, is Abner. And Abner, Abner says, I've, I've had enough of this. And so Abner meets with the different elders of all of the tribes of Israel. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 17. It says, Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, For some time past you've been seeking David as king over you. Now then bring it about, for the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin, and then Abner went to tell David at Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought to do. So he says, okay, listen. I know that God has chosen David, and so he meets with all of the tribal elders, all of the leaders of all of the tribes, including the tribe of Benjamin, which is where Saul came from, where Ishbosheth came from, the most loyal to Saul's line, to Ishbosheth, right? And so Abner meets with all of the leaders, and they all agree, you know what? 
enough of this, let's all unite under David. And so it's exciting. It's a part of the story and you think, okay, finally this war is going to end. Now this civil war and all of this tension and all of this fighting, it's going to come to an end and Abner's going to help. And of course he's betraying Ishbosheth's trust and, and he's going to bring everybody together. But then just as you're kind of getting excited about what might happen and, and all of this unity that might be brought about, Joab who's the opposite commander. He's the commander of David's troops, okay? So you have Abner on one side who commands the tribes of, of Israel and then the tribe of Judah. Their commander is Joab. And Joab, he hates Abner's guts because Abner's killed his brother and he distrusts him and he hates him and he wants him dead. In fact, he murders him. And just, just right as they're on the brink of unity, just as they're on the brink of unity, as they're going to bring all of the tribes together under David, and then Joab murders the guy that was trying to bring them all together. Now, I think David's reaction, chapter 3 and verse 35, is interesting. David mourns for Abner. And, of course, Abner's the commander of his enemy's armies, and he mourns for him. Even though he's on the other side, he's one of them. David mourns for him and he fasts. It says, all the people came to persuade David to eat bread while it was yet day. But David swore saying, God do so to me and more also if I taste bread or anything else till the sun goes down. And look at verse 36. It says, and all the people took notice of it and it pleased them as everything that the king did pleased all the people. So all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's will to put to death Abner, the son of Ner. So they, they look and they say he, he has compassion on us and it, he, he didn't put Abner to death, that this was something Joab did on his own. But just as, just as that, that tragedy and that event sort of pass, then, then you have two guys that go and they assassinate Ishbosheth. They think, okay, we gotta, we gotta deal with this guy. And so they sneak in and they kill Ishbosheth and then they come to David with the news, hey, we've, we've murdered your enemy. We've murdered the, the king of your enemies. And so, aren't you proud of us? Didn't we do a good job? And of course, David doesn't appreciate that at all. And he not only punishes the assassins, but he, he mourns the death of Ishbosheth, he mourns the death of his enemy. So as I'm reading through all of this, and as you read through the history of, of Israel, and you kind of ask yourself, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? Are the good guys David and his people? Well, then you got Joab, who's David's right-hand man. Are, are, are they the good guys and the other guys are the bad guys? Are the, are the bad guys Saul's descendants, Ishbosheth, and all of Israel? The truth is that everybody had done wrong. Isn't that true? Everybody had, had messed up. Everybody had blood on their hands. Everybody had killed and destroyed and hurt and sinned and injured. Everybody, everybody in the story is flawed. We haven't really started to highlight David's flaws yet, but we know, don't we, that even David is a flawed individual. And people on both sides have enough reason to resent and hate everybody else on the other side and think, you're not one of my people. You're from Judah, or you're from Benjamin, or you're from fill in the blank. You're one of those other tribes. You're one of those other people. And don't you know what your people have done to my people? Don't you know the crimes? Don't you know the horrible violence that you've done to my people? Don't you know our history? People on both sides of the aisle could have said that to one another, couldn't they? People on both sides of the line could have said that. But because of David's kindness... And his love for his enemies, he unites the people of Israel. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. I mean, that, that includes the tribe of Benjamin, right? that Saul was from, that Ishbosheth was from, that Abner, who was just murdered, 
that he was the commander of all of those troops. And all of those people came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. So remember back many years before, before Saul started hating David and before he drove him out and before he tried to murder him. Again, there were flaws and crimes and violence on both sides. And Saul had hated David and drove him out. But before that, David was the commander of Saul's armies and he had led out and brought in Israel And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. Here's what David was doing, was uniting flawed people, right? He was uniting flawed people. He, he, was, he was flawed, but Judah, his tribe, was flawed. And the tribes of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin and all the rest, they were flawed people. But they came together in unity with other flawed people, which means they had to overlook things in the past and they had to put their bitterness aside and they had to put their resentment aside and they had to put their anger aside and they had to say, this was God's will for us to come together as one people. And of course, we hopefully, when we read all of these stories about David and we read all through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and we realize that the descendant of David is Jesus, right? And that Jesus is not the flawed king, but the flawless king. And like David, Jesus loves his enemies. And like David, he's uniting not only the tribes of Israel, but uniting the tribes of the entire world. And there is nothing more important to Jesus than unity. There is nothing more important to Jesus than bringing people together in unity. We we think about the things that Jesus said in his ministry. He said things like, listen, if you're offering your gift at the altar, I mean, what could be more important than that? What could be more important than worshiping God? What could be more important than offering a gift to God on the altar? Jesus said, I'll tell you what's more important than that, reconciliation. If you're offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, finish offering your gift. Is that what he said? Didn't, not finish offering your gift, but go first. Leave your gift at the altar and first go and be reconciled with your brother. And after reconciliation happens, then come back and finish offering your gift at the altar. Nothing, nothing is more important to Jesus than bringing people together. David is this flawed king in many ways, but he united flawed people, people that had to put, to put aside and put past them their resentment and anger and bitterness. But Jesus is this flawless king who is uniting flawed people. It would be easy, wouldn't it? I mean, it would be easy to unify flawless people, right? It would be, unity among flawless people would be incredibly easy. But that, that just can't happen. It would be easy if, if you agreed with me on everything, and I agreed with you on everything, and we never had a disagreement for us to be in unity. It would be easy if we didn't have a past where your people hurt my people or my people hurt your people. It would be easy if I had never made mistakes. It'd be easy if you had never made mistakes. It'd be easy if you had never hurt me. It'd be easy if I had never hurt you. It'd be easy if we had never said anything that hurt each other's feelings or done something that harmed one another. That would be incredibly easy to unify flawless people. But what's challenging is unifying flawed people. Unifying people that have said things that are hurtful. Unifying people that have done things that are hurtful. Unifying people from different tribes and different backgrounds 
people that have a history, people that have baggage, people that have clashed in the past, people that don't understand everything that you understand, or people that don't care about the things that you care about. But that kind of unity, unifying flawed people, that's the only kind of unity that exists. There, there can't be a unity of flawless people because there are no flawless people. There are only flawed people. There are only people that have made mistakes. And there are only people that have sinned. And there are only people that have hurt other people. And there are only people that have misunderstandings. And there are only people that are broken. And so if there's going to be unity, it's going to be a unity of flawed people. And, and here's, here's what I take away from this whole story and putting it together with Jesus is this. If flawed people from flawed tribes could unite around a flawed king, then we can unite around a flawless king, Jesus, right? If flawed people, people that had been at war with each other for seven and a half years, who even before that had a history and had tension, had baggage, people that not, not just their ancestors or their relatives had done horrible things to each other, but they had, as individuals, they had done horrible things and said horrible things, had committed crimes and atrocities against each other. Flawed individuals from flawed tribes that had cultures and backgrounds and histories of clashing with other tribes within Israel. And if, if these flawed individuals from these flawed tribes could unite around a flawed king, like David, as good as he was, and we haven't, again, highlighted his sins yet, but we know he was a flawed individual. But if those flawed people from flawed tribes could unite around a flawed king, then surely, then surely, certainly, flawed people like us from flawed tribes, from flawed backgrounds, from flawed groups, could unite around the flawless King Jesus. Amen. Yes. Yes. People are messed up. And guess what? So are you. So am I. They've hurt you. And guess what? You've hurt others too. There is nothing more important to Jesus than bringing flawed people together into one body who will love each other and support each other and be there for each other and carry one another's burdens in spite of our flaws. A unity that only exists until somebody messes up isn't unity at all, right? A unity that only exists until you disagree with someone isn't unity at all. A unity that only exists until someone messes up isn't a unity at all. A unity that exists only until you figure out that the other person is flawed isn't a unity at all. The only kind of unity that exists, the only kind of unity that is possible is a unity of flawed people. But we're not uniting around each other's perfection. We're uniting around King Jesus. It's Jesus who's bringing us together. In spite of our backgrounds. In spite of mistakes that our people or ourselves as individuals have made. Jesus is bringing us together. And so the goal here is in spite of our own flaws and in spite of the flaws of other people is to move towards greater Unity. Our whole theme this year is taking the next step by faith. And when I read this story about people from the tribe of Benjamin and people from the tribe of Judah coming together and being part of the same nation and part of the same family around King David, and that reminding me that you and I from different tribes and different backgrounds, in spite of our flaws, have to come together around King Jesus, then it makes me ask, what's my next step towards greater Unity. What's your next step towards greater unity? Is there someone in your life that you need to forgive? 
can be hard, can't it? They messed up. They said something. They did something. Something that hurt you or something that hurt someone else. Jesus is all about not only forgiving them of their sins and forgiving you of your sins, but bringing you and them together into the same family. That's what Jesus wants to accomplish in you is unity. And so maybe your next step is a phone call. Maybe your next step is a text message. Maybe your next step is a hug. Maybe your next step is having a conversation with somebody you haven't had a conversation with in a very long time. Or maybe your next step is having a conversation with with someone you haven't had a conversation with at all. Maybe it's just telling someone, I want to get to know you better. I don't know you. I don't want to get to know you. Maybe your next step is just telling somebody, I want to hear your story because we're family and I want to listen to you and I want to hear where you come from and I want to hear how how you met your spouse and I want to hear hear who you are and, and what makes you tick. I want to know you because Jesus is bringing us together. But maybe your next step is telling somebody, I forgive you and I want to put our past behind us. If tribes that had been at war for seven and a half years could come together in unity around King David, then you and whoever it is that you've been at war with can come together in unity around King Jesus. In spite of your differences of opinions, in spite of your backgrounds, in spite of your history, in spite of your flaws or their flaws, Jesus wants to not only forgive us, but to unify us. But in order for that unity to happen and take place, we've got to walk towards each other. We've got to take a step towards them. And we have to decide that no matter what, I'm going to hold on to you. I'm going to hang on to you. Because I know from the get-go that you're messed up. And you know from the get-go that I messed up. We know going into this thing that unity means we stick together in spite. In spite not only of our background and our history, but in spite of our current flaws and shortcomings and weaknesses. We are in this together. Jesus is bringing us together and we're unified not because we agree on every ch- on everything we're unified not because we're all equally perfect we're unified because Jesus is perfect we're unified because of his love we're unified because of his perfection we're unified because of his kingship we're unified because we're unifying around Jesus we're throwing down and putting down our banners and lifting high the banner of Christ and so this week there's something that you can do something that I can do to take one step towards someone else and say I want to get to know you better or I want to put our past behind us and I want to be closer family the way Jesus intended for it to be. Maybe there's somebody here this morning and you haven't been baptized into Jesus. We think a lot about the forgiveness that comes at baptism and that's true. There's forgiveness and mercy that come when we're baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins but there's also unity that happens. Isn't that an amazing thing? Like Dave was talking about this morning, when we break the bread and drink the cup, we're, we're communing not only with the people in this room, but we're communing with our brothers and sisters all over the world. And when you're baptized into Christ, you're unified, reconciled not only with God, but with people all over the world. People that, that look very different than you. People that talk very different than you. People that have different nationalities and different backgrounds. Jesus is bringing and intends to bring all people of all tribes and all nations and all languages and all races together into a single unified family. And that's what we're participating in and stepping into when we're baptized into Jesus. And so maybe there's somebody here this morning that is ready to be unified with the body of Christ and with God himself or maybe 
Maybe we just need to take, maybe we've made that decision and we just need to take another step back towards him and back towards the family of God. If we can help you with that in any way, now's a great opportunity to come forward as we stand and sing.